good morning. <laughs> I'm surprised so many of you managed to get out this morning. I mean, I hardly did, looking out the window. Um, I made a really bad mistake. I, I asked, I was supposed to be on first, and I, I thought they'd get rid of the crowd first or whatever. And, um, oh, good, that, that's testing. Um, so, I, because I thought I might take, I, I, come, I just come from San Francisco, yes, San Francisco. And uh, I thought I might take a, a red eye, so maybe shouldn't start the morning solo is um, gracefully replaced me this morning. And now, of course, that was a mistake. I mean, <laughs> you can't follow up that stuff. It was so, I'm sitting there, I'm stunned. I mean, I've seen this stuff, but I'm, I'm, I'm jealous because I don't have a portfolio. I never had, you know, paid for anybody to photograph their stuff. And, and my, my physical archive was thrown away by some ex-partners uh, a few years ago. That's what happens in a, in a, in a, in a, com in a um, business divorce also. They, you know, it's basically like burning your wife's or husband's socks or whatever. I know wives don't have socks, do they? <laughs> whatever, you know, I'm, I'm now totally stunned. Anyway, <laughs> um, the other issue is, is that uh, when you get to my age, I'm as old as the, the TDC. I'm actually half a year younger, just really. I'm, I'll be 70 very soon before I know it, unfortunately. Um, so I, that was the reason. Half, well, half the reason I'm here is because, of course, the only way to get rid of Carol is to say yes to her. Because, <laughs> you know, she attaches herself to you like a like an octopus, and I uh, have, okay, okay, okay. okay. Well, I couldn't think of any more excuses because I happen to be in the country. Uh, uh, so rather than, you know, pretending I died, which is not something you can maintain for very long, um, I mean, you have to, like, cut down your, t your Twitter account and all that stuff. So uh, I thought, okay, Carol, I come. But we, we do go back, like, uh, almost as long as the TDC does. And um, I thought, ah, you know what, well, I can just skip over quickly. But I built something here for you, not a portfolio show, because I said I don't have one. There, there is a book, luckily, written about me a couple of years ago, so I can photograph those pages. Uh, those guys found stuff that, you know, if you don't have your own portfolio, you go back to your, the people who worked for you, because they steal all the manuals. Uh, they, they, they take all the manuals home that you produce, and they have lots of more specimens than I ever did. And then I thought, well, you know, I've been, I've been coming to New York for a while, and maybe this is the opportunity to sort of put my, my I don't call this a career because I never had a career. My, my work in the perspective uh, starting maybe here. So the, 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 the one good news for you, this, this actually shall be in English, as you've noticed already. Uh, I'm always tempted to just do a whole lecture in German just to see your faces. <laughs> or in Italian, for that matter, which is a much more uh, beautiful language. German is practical. That's why we build shit, because we build our own language. And we, can, we can build it as we go along. The famous composite nouns that we have are incredibly powerful, but a little beyond you, so I shan't. Um, I started off as, a, as, as a, uh, Mario's. <laughs> now I will never, ever call you Matteo. You know that, right? <laughs> Dottore Matteo, as he, he said, who's named for, uh, for Italian spaghetti sauce, apparently. The Bolognese, right? Or is that named for you, or you for it? Pasta asciutta, yeah. Okay. I found out, by the way, there's another reason uh, to, to uh, drink coffee in Italy. It's one, it's one euro if you don't sit down. I just paid four dollars for a disgusting espresso this morning. It sucked totally. Uh, I mean, I got another one free because the first one totally sucked, but four dollars for an espresso? Jesus, I mean, that is daylight robbery. Anyway, I, I was a victim. Um, where was I? Where was I? Okay, yes. <laughs> I, I, I started many things and didn't finish them. I, I studied history of art, and while I, did, while I went to school already, I, I did an apprenticeship as a compositor. I'm talking about the 60s here, way before most of you were born. So, you know, that was touching type by you know, hand. So I, I learned all that stuff properly. And uh, I had my own little print shop. This is the 1977. I, I'm doing the 70s. By the way, we will have another anniversary coming up at Martin Luther. Luther, as you say, Luther, we say the real one the white guy, um, uh, he'll be, he would have been 500 this year. Well, actually, his, his thesis were 500 this year. So major issue. There's a great exhibition, if it's still on the Morgan here, which I, I, I went to see just before Christmas, where they go on about uh, how Martin Luther and the Reformation wouldn't have been possible without Gutenberg, who invented, well, sort of made, made possible printing with movable type about 50 years before Luther wrote his famous uh, uh, 95 thesis that he nailed on, on, the, on the door of his church. And if it hadn't been for printing, we still be all Catholic. Well, I know you are anyway, but I, I'm, um, or Jewish or whatever came first, but certainly wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any Protestants, nor would there be any common sense because printing brought that about. So I learned 
printing. And this is my, the picture of, of uh, the shop that I had in London in 1977 in July after it just burned down. So I'm picking up the leftovers and it was so disgusting that I, I threw the whatever was left over away. And then what are you if you're a letterpress printer without letterpress, without type, you're a designer. Because all you needed at the time was a pencil. And um, that's how it, how it began. And I, instead of having a print shop, I then invested in a, I guess you guys call it a stat camera, reproduction camera. Some of you may remember what this is. I know Alan does, but <laughs> some, of, some of them in the, f in the first row, yeah, no, 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 yeah, we remember that. Uh, most of you don't, right? So you would, you would make whatever artwork. Uh, in Germany, we use film because we're clever, because film is transparent. It's much easier to make up than stupid paper, which you guys do over here for some reason. The reason is negative and positive plates, but that's another lecture. Um, we had uh, positive plates because we're not stupid. Uh, whatever, you put your original on the bottom there, and then you move it up and down the bellows, change its sizes, and you sort of look down to it. On my camera, you always have to put your foot on the copy board to put it in focus, because I bought it secondhand. Um, and then you shoot your artwork to whatever size, up or down, and then you do some more makeup and whatever. And then you deliver um, to your client. You don't deliver data, you deliver a, a board or a piece of film or whatever. So that's, that's how I, I started. And for a long time, I worked in photo setting, I guess. That, that it was called a, a period that most of you, again, have missed. Lasted about, what, from the late 60s until the late 80s. So maybe 20, 25 years at most. Uh, and I did all the type for, Ber I mean, I designed all the specimens for Bertel. I think um, there must have been a few hundred at the time. These were all done in photo setting, but this is not artwork. This is all set in position. Another, another lecture for some other time. And um, now uh, this isn't, doesn't become, begin to be as beautiful as, uh, as Louise's stuff, but I didn't design this. I designed this typeface. And of course, my, my fascination with all Bertel stuff meant that in the late 70s, I started redrawing some of the metal faces that I had previously had and lost in that fire in London. Um, and they published it, and of course I used it. Um, this, but this was artwork. And I just recently, I was in, in Los Angeles last week, and somebody s uses them still, because I mean, these were the, the, the wobbly typefaces that way ahead of before we had biological, I guess all food was biological at one time, but before it became a, a branded issue. Uh, I just saw this in Berlin Grotesque in Los Angeles of all places, but it's still made for the sort of handmade wobbly stuff. Um, so I became for a while the sort of expert for the wobbly face. They, they, I had an article written about me in, in some magazine in, in London, the man with the wobbly faces, because those wobbly faces, I mean, they actually had a reason. If you, they designed them around the, in the teens and, and up into the 20s. If you print letterpress type on, say, a platen press, you are exerting a few thousand pounds, kilograms, whatever, of pressure onto the type, which means it's fucked after a, a thousand prints. Excuse me, whatever, no, no, it's another word for that. Destroyed, so, sorry, destroyed. Um, so you, you, you do two things by, by giving it a wobbly outline. A, you increase the outline, because you all know that if you wobble it, it becomes longer. Uh, try that with a string, you know, if you tighten it, it's shorter than, than a wobbly one. So you increase the, the surface, uh, but you also make it, you pre-destroy pre it, so it looks destroyed, it'll still be destroyed afterwards. Um, and it became very fashionable in the 70s becoming fashionable again for those sort of wholemeal kind of uh, products that you see all over. Unless they're elegant, uh, like the stuff Louise made, if they sort of have to be, to look ho uh, home produced, they, um, they use those sort of wobbly typefaces still. And in those days, you did artwork, you drew stuff, and then you have somebody like Günther Gerd Lange, whom some of you may remember. Uh, did he ever, did, was he a TDC medalist? He was. I did, didn't I? That's right, yeah. So there's three crowds here. Um, was Hermann the German, Hermann Zapf, who died last year, Günther Gerd Lange, who was Bertolt's art director forever, and, and my teacher, and, and moi. Oh, of course. No, Georg Trump. Yeah, oh, thank, yeah, thank you. Yeah, he designed a typeface called Trump Medieval. Yeah, which is, I thought I wasn't going to pronounce that word ever again. I call him 45, okay? Don't give him the honor of pronouncing the, oh, never mind. Well, by the way, the, the, the TDC uh, competition, uh, would you have to exclude certain countries from submitting very soon? I mean, there might be some Arab type in there. You know, that's the beginning of the end. Can't let that end the country. Oh, God. I'm going back to Europe next week, and everybody will be asking me, you know, what the fuck, what goes on there? And I have no idea. I mean, how am I going to explain this? This is a civilized place, right? This room, at least. God knows. Anyway, so that's how, how we work. I'm, I'm only showing this for some of you kids who haven't been, been around. This is as tedious, but as also useful. Uh, uh, Lange would do these 
and this was like uh, about 16 point type. It was a little A4 sheet, you know, similar to a letter here. And um, he would write this in about two point type, uh, mostly in caps. And, and he would have his, 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 his uh, smallest measurement would, would be a moisedarm, which is a mouse gut. And if you ever looked at a mouse gut, it's pretty thin. I mean, I haven't quite frankly, but I, you know what he means when he said, take a mouse gut off here. And if you try to cheat and not take it off, next time around he would notice. He would say, oh, you didn't take that mouse gut off, off the O or whatever. So that was good training. I, I learned how to draw type until this is, this is taken in the, in the summer of 1985. Uh, you know that the Mac came out shortly, and I, I'm on record as having bought the first ever Macintosh uh, photographic designer in Germany. For what reason? I'd seen my first one at Linotype slash Stempel back in, in the, at the end of uh, 84. They had one because they, they gave the license for their 13 core fonts, or some of them at least. And um, I knew instinctively that this was the beginning of a new era. I did not quite know why, but I also knew, like most of us did at the time, it was so difficult to get a hold of type. I mean, if you, if you had to make a mock-up, you had to trace it, which took forever, or you sort of rubbed on letter set or whatever. You had a friend who could pull your a line at some studio. Photo setting was like, even at the time, and I'm talking uh, the, uh, about the 70s here, or the early 80s, it was $300 slash euros, and marks, whatever, an hour then, which would be like 3,000 hour now, uh, and you couldn't do it again because there was no data. So you fucked up, you fucked up, and you had to pay over. So, or you started cutting stuff up from individual letters. So the Macintosh, when it first came out, I knew even though it was total Mickey Mouse type, it was, you know, the, the terrible big bitmaps and stuff, I knew that would change my, my life, and it certainly did. And uh, very shortly after, I think 87, we're in the, in the seven periods here, so another 30 years ago, um, Peter, Peter von Blockland in Holland wrote uh, um, the... Uh, the Icarus program for the Macintosh. Icarus was, as you can see at the time, you would, you would draw letters, outlines, like these are my pencil drawings, and then you would plot them to get the data into the computer. So you didn't draw on screen, you draw on paper, which I still do, and I'm still better at it because I'm old. Um, and you plot those back in, so you have like, you have corner points, you have tangent points, and you have circular uh, m m curve points. So that's how I started digitizing m type uh, on, the, on the Macintosh. And then the famous one, I, I, had, I have only one picture uh, type 87, which um, the TDC started, so that was my first encounter. In fact, my first trip to the United States at the Grand Central. Um, I was 40 at the time, and I hadn't ha ever seen a reason to come to America because, you know, we'd seen all the movies, you know, 77 Sunset Strip and all that shit. America was the country where everybody drove up and immediately found a parking spot, um, <laughs> at least on the movies in, in the 70s, you know. That, so that I thought, why, why go there, you know? Um, <laughs> I couldn't bring a car anyway. So I, d I did come because somebody persuaded me, Roger or Carol or both of you. I, I had been meeting some of the ITC guys in, in Europe. And uh, then I went to the West Coast. And see, uh, for some reason, I wore a tie always, even on my bicycle. It's so weird. Don't, I don't know. I thought maybe I was trying to be respectable because I was starting to lose my hair. Um, what always surprised me that I, I, I used to get on my bike just like this. And my American friends would spend half an hour in the bathrooms getting into all their spandex gear and, and their cleats and their shoes and their helmets and shit. And then we get on the, on, on the Golden Gate Britain, they'd be tired. <laughs> and I just started. Oh, it's funny. Well, we know we use bicycles on a, on a, on a daily basis. Um, so I then started getting American clients. So there's Herman Miller on the left, and there's, uh, I did some stuff for Aldous, which PageMaker, does anyone remember PageMaker? Of course you don't remember. Yeah, I, I, you remember everything I know that. John might also, right? Uh, Page maker? Yeah. You're old enough. Yeah, you know, that's just a little gear that you throw there and it does it. And that bike is just For what? That bike is just a classic piece of technology. Was it? It was just a little gear that had the uh, that bike with the seven that had the uh, type 87 and then right after that. Are you sure? I've got to rewrite my history then. I, my records, are, I, I can probably look it up. Thanks, thanks. Just John Downer, by the way, who is obviously uh, over 40, so he knows that shit. <laughs> Alan Schultz. <Schoenser. laughs> well, you know, oh good. <laughs> well, the good things, you know, I can write my own bio anyway, as everybody else has done. You know, you can you can forge your own documents. Um, all, all I'm saying is basically, and that's that's mostly for you guys here, that uh, coming here did change my life. Um, I've come back since. I, I married an American lady and. Um, I've had lots of American clients for, for, you know, for, for what it's worth. Um, I'm, I'm doing pictures from the book. And of course, I became a, a consultant for ITC. Alan, you remember? And they would fly me over, what, three or four times a year? Yeah, we would fly 
It's, I would stay at Coop. Well, I, I flew, co uh, I flew uh, um, economy when the people smoked. And um, I remember coming over once and I was in the last row, four seats abreast, and there was two Russians on, on, on the side of me. And they smoked incessantly. And I felt like a, like a ham when I got here. I was horrible. <laughs> I mean, people smoked on planes. Can you believe it? I mean, that was Pan Am, by the way. Cool airline other than that. But that was before I had status and could afford it. But I stayed at cool places like the Royalton. You know, anyway, is, is that, does it still exist? It was cool. I mean, it was a ridiculous hotel, but it was cool. Um, and it made me kind of cool, I think. Um, anyway, I was on the, on the, um, on the t uh, IDC board, and I, I suggested a few things. I just read this the other day. I don't know if you can read it from there, but one of the things in there says, uh, you should redesign Gil Sands. Now, this is 30 years ago, and they did it last year, right? <laughs> Took a t Not ITC, but now it's all the same difference. It's all monotype anyway. But because um, it, it was obvious at the time that, you know, Gil was a great typeface, but a very sort of uncoordinated, as, as those, those typefaces were, very uncoordinated family, and um, it needed the cleanup, because at that time we started having those families that even sons and services. Anyway, one of the things I suggested uh, to do was a correspondence typeface, because we, what, what we started having in 87, people started using their computer for their correspondence. So you would type a letter on the computer, and I thought doing that in Helvetica or Times or, or Zap Chancery or whatever we had on the computer was kind of like a little silly. It should look like a, still like a letter, but using the advantage of, of, the, of the modern laser printer without the disadvantage of the typewriter. And uh, so I suggested it, and then Alan or somebody turned around and said, okay, why don't you do it? And I hadn't suggested it for myself because I was scared shitless of doing digital type. So I did, and it was called, later it was called Officina, right? Not correspondence anymore, which is uh, the only time, or the first and only time I've ever, ever named a typeface with more than four characters. It's become a stupid trench, which is actually stupid. If you ever design a, uh, design a typeface and name it, uh, it's got to have an A in it because it's the most beautiful letter. It's also the most significant one. It's got to be as long as possible because people can see more if you show the word. If you sh the type is just called meta. Very unfortunate combination, the TA in the first place. And uh, you know, and also you, you have to name it with an A. Like I mean, if, if Ariel had been called Zariel, nobody would have ever used it. <laughs> um, you know, it's, way, way, you know, it's in the cellar when you, when you pull on the menu. So Officina, I, I thought was cool, o Officina, of course, we would say, right? Which I think is still a, a beautiful name for a typeface because it's a generic. And it survived pretty well. We, we did a folder, remember? We, we, they, you paid for having a, actually a little folder printed. Um, I don't have a, s I don't, unfortunately, don't have a sample of that anymore. But so luckily, s at some point, I took a photograph or somebody took a photograph. So they went to great expense to uh, introduce that. This is 90. And this is just for the, for the folks in here who want to be a type designer. That was the first check I got from ITC, <laughs> uh, which obviously I've never cashed in. Uh, one, one dollar and nine cents. So if you, if you want to have a career as a type designer, I don't think you're going to be rich anytime soon. It was different then, and I must admit, Officina still pays. Uh, it still gets sold. So uh, there are people who buy for, uh, who pay for fonts, by the way case any of you here wondered. Um, there is a little trickle still, which is quite, I have never sort of accumulated, but it's been over the last, what, 30, yeah, almost 30 years now. Um, it's, it's reasonable, you know, it wouldn't be enough to pay a mortgage, but it's certainly reasonable, and it's always fun because, I mean, have, have, having a license for work you did like 30 years ago, it's amazing, the money just comes in and you think, great, it's a present, I'm not doing anything towards it anymore. But I, I did. I mean, uh, one thing I've always done, uh, uh, I like, if you ever buy one of my typefaces or a license for a typeface, I should say, or for a font if you want, um, mine will always have errors in. I've always liked errors. I have no idea why I like errors, because I do signage systems. So we updated, obviously, you know, a couple of times. There is, of course, the Serif and the Sons. Um, when, we, when I redesigned The Economist, this is from 2001. Uh, we're just in the middle of redesigning it again. We um, use it extensively, and we ended up having to make uh, this is a recent cover. No, just coincidence that I picked that one. Um, we had to. And we, we we did the. Uh, we did some more weights for Officina in the uh, in the mid 90s um, with an assistant of mine at the studio at Meta Design, and uh, the economists thought the the uh, the bold weight or the black weight, which a little they called it a little too goofy. It was a little soft and, and wobbly. So we redesigned uh, uh, Officina. We call it headline or display. It's called, which is a, you can't, another thing, you can't call a typeface display anymore because a display now means a screen. 
display in the Old Testament large, now you have to call it screen or, or something, or large or whatever, or headline. Uh, all these things have also s uh, changed, and they're still using it. Now, now the quick overview um, to get it out of this out the system of the, the, the typeface I've designed. I am actually not a typeface designer, I'm a graphic designer. I just happen to do this on the side. Uh, but when I looked at this, there's a shitload of stuff here, and most of them have been done for large companies like Cisco or Bosch or German Railways or, you know, sort of The Economist and stuff. Um, this in other words, all the stuff you wouldn't even have heard of, and neither should you, because that's the whole, whole uh, um, role type plays. You know, it's the, it's the invisible voice. It's not invisible as we've seen with Louise's stuff, and uh, again, I was so happy uh, seeing that because her, her work is the best proof that type and image are the same things. You, you see it before you read it, and you, you create an impression, even of a newspaper page, or a, I mean, you know it's the New York Times with your eyes half closed because it looks like the New York Times before you even start reading it. Uh, and you get, a, especially in packaging, you have an impression of the packaging before you've realized whether it's coffee or chocolate. And that's the great power of type. And then it informs you on the next level, even down to, to the ingredients. So this is all the stuff I've been doing. Most of it you wouldn't have heard of and you shouldn't have heard of because that's the whole cool thing about being a type designer, the background that nobody knows this, the stuff you do, which I, I kind of find interesting. Even stuff like, you know, I, I get I get great fun out of out of the stuff that nobody knows. Like this is the uh, one of the big. We have a couple of public channels in TV in Germany, that Im meaning there's no ads, so you can actually look at something for more than ten seconds. Uh, I mean, here I have to go and have a pee every ten minutes or five minutes because I can't stand sitting there watching this crap. So uh, we don't have adverts on on, uh, which is really um, um, refreshing. And uh, you can do stuff with type. I think this might work. Yeah. So this is a font. There's f between three and five instances. This is for the weather maps on, on TV there. Um, and they put them in as little GIFs, uh, which makes it much quicker than, than having to animate them before. So that was an invention, I think, that we did. But the coolest thing, as I said, is, is nobody knows this. I mean, it doesn't say at, at the bottom of the news, which they, they run 10 times a day, you know, uh, typeface and, and uh, interface and, and icons designed by Spiekermann. Nor does it, does it say here, one of the biggest German brands, we have trains that run on time and are pretty fast and affordable. So we did the whole um, identity for them, what, 2005, I think, or 2002, we started 2005, it was done. And of course, these day, well, whenever I've done a major uh, identity work, whether it's for Volkswagen or Audi or those big brands, I have to not drop the names down again, uh, I happen to design a typeface for them, or at least adapt one for Volkswagen, we adapted for Tour, which they unfortunately abolished a, a year ago or so. So we designed a typeface. But for me, that's kind of like, this is our Christian Schwartz uh, and, and me, uh, as in fact, in, in most of my typeface, I should mention that, other than the, the stuff I did initially, uh, I've always had good people work with me. Christian is, is my, my best uh, uh, New York um, partner here who does amazing stuff. I just give him really crappy sketches and he turns it into the most amazing stuff. Uh, and then there's all the, the tedious stuff, you know, you, you design the first 96 characters and then there's 400 on, on each weight. And my life's way too short to do that. And luckily these kids these days in, in their 20s, 30s and 40s do the stuff digitally so quickly that I, I can only just, you know, be amazed and I'm very happy. But I, I thrive on designing complex stuff like timetables. It's, that's what I really like. Um, and I, I want them to, to look good and be legible. And, and again, one of those pleasures is you sit in there and you drink your coffee and I, I know, like I designed this typeface. And nobody else knows in the whole train, so I can sit there and I don't know what, I, it's a weird kick to get out of it. I love the fact that nobody knows it. I'm not telling them, you know, and I'm talking to the conductor, I designed this, that would be embarrassing. I said, Chink, look, I did all this shit and this brand is all over the country and I got a medal for it and all the rest of it and nobody knows. It's like Um It's it's the best, I think it's the best thing about that stuff, that it doesn't have my name on it. Or, or the Berlin Transit, which we did. I mean, that's talking about what, what you guys were saying about your portfolio. Uh, I pursued the Berlin Transit Authority for about seven or eight years. I sent them letters, I sent them, well, that was before emails. I went there with the presentation, they threw me out. I had a house for boat, meaning don't ever come back because I showed them slides of, of their existence. I said, you know, and, and they said, how dare you show us these ugly pictures? I said, that's your fucking signs. I mean, it's your stations, you, you know, I didn't make them. Uh, they hated it, they hated to be confronted with the reality. But then of course, uh, after, you know, seven or eight years not getting anywhere, the wall came down and there was two Berlins and uh, somebody had to do signage for the two halves and they didn't know anybody else. So they had to come crawling to me and said, 
could you perhaps please, I just looked at that correspondence because you're doing a book about it. They really asked me politely, could we have a meeting? And then when then we had the meeting, could you please consider, I know we've been bad to you and la di la, would you possibly, and so, well, just, I mean, it's the biggest fucking job you can have in your life. I mean, your own city, redesigning it after 40 years of separation, you're designing a signage system, come on, I mean, and you get paid for it, jeez. But again, nobody knows I did it. So I sit there looking at these signs. After 25 years or 27 years, they need a little bit of update, but they're, they're, they're still okay. Same goes for an airport. You know, it's the coolest thing to land at an airport. And say, I did all the signs here. And then that's, I designed the typeface for it. That's pretty cool. Or uh, all, the, all the streets in Austria. I mean, I des didn't design the street signs. I wouldn't have done that ugly arrow. I, I do way better arrows than that one. <laughs> but you go all over Austria and uh, of course, they picked the wrong weight. You know, I did three weights. Th th I did, uh, did, uh, did bitmaps first, a, a wide one, a narrow one, and a very narrow one. Of course, they take all the very narrow ones because it's easier. Of course, they have things like, you know, Rheinbrechtsdorfer Straße, which, uh, of course, um, it's not, a, not the title of a novel. It's just a street, but um, they squeeze it in. So it's not as, as good as it could be, but it's still cool to, to, uh, to drive down the, the, the roads and streets in, in Austria and see who? No, no, we drew them all. Oh, yeah, but this is the photograph. This is taken from down here, and oh, no, no, my God. That's a, I see. No, no, it's, 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 it's just a, a skewed photograph. Come on, this is reality. I, don't, I said I have no portfolio. Go there. Check it. <laughs> as, as long as you can. God knows when they're, oh, no, actually, the Austrians will always, always be able to get in here because, you know, they share a history with certain people in D.C., The Austrians tried very hard to, to tell everybody that Beethoven was Austrian and Hitler was German. It was the other way around, by the way. Just for, just for the record, okay, Beethoven was born in Bonn, Germany. Hitler was born in Braunau am Inn in Austria, okay? It's important. I mean, we elected him. He only had 32% of the last elections, by the way. Not the popular vote. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he uh, maneuvered himself, you know, through... Uh, Picking the right enemies, silence in the press. Well, you know the story. Having people banned from coming to the country, and you know, and over time from banning to imprisoning, and yeah, I shouldn't go there. Another great thing, if, if your design type is, then it becomes physical. So for s a few years, I don't know how long is it ago, ten years ago, I was asked by Design Within Reach by the then chairman to design house numbers for them, which is great because I mean, you know, the one thing about the type that we, we design is usually pretty ephemeral. It's on paper or, or on signs on something, but actually have it in your little hand. These are 12 centimeters or four and a half inches for you lot. Did you know that America is the last, uh, USA I should say? Can, I can't say America when you're, in, when you're in Canada or in Mexico, it's also America. This is the United States of America. Um, you're the last country other than Liberia to use that stupid imperial system. And it's called the imperial system. And you chuck the tea in the harbor in Boston to get rid of the empire, and you call you use an imperial system, and the water freezes at 32 degrees? <laughs> Zero in centigrade, okay. A hundred, it boils. God. The extra brain power you use for that shit, you could use for something else, like have free education. Maybe that's why you have that system, to keep people dumb, I don't know. Uh, incidentally, if, you, if anybody wants to go to university or college, come to Germany, it's free, even for foreigners. We recently had a strike by German students because they were going to charge money for the foreign, stu foreign students. So the German students went on strike because we don't pay for education. I know our defense budget is a little low, but you know the money goes where it should go. Another setting fi fine thing is sometimes you do something and it disappears. I, I did these bitmaps for Nokia, and then they, it says 2002 up there, right? And then they came back and said, um, well, let's do some outline fonts. And we did some outline fonts and then a few years later, Nokia went for a new sort of bland brand, and um, it disappeared. And then just recently, it's come back. Just know that this is, you probably heard this, this uh, phone for $50, it's just a phone. It does nothing else. It does, I think it takes photographs, but uh, it's just a phone. And now my, my, f my, my type is back in. Isn't that cool? After, after disappearing for 10 or more years, uh, I was just thinking, you know, it's a really cool type. They don't use it. Maybe I could reuse it and reissue it and call it something else. Uh, I do four letters, so it could have been Noki, um, or Noka, or whatever. <laughs> and now, unfortunately, <laughs> they, they must have, they, whoever bought the, the Nokia brand obviously bought the license. Or maybe they didn't. Maybe I should look into that. <laughs> I think Monotype has the, has the license. 
And of course, one thing I, 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 uh, I also did, um, and that's partly thanks to, to being, uh, to being in, in the States, I started Fond Shop in sort of 88, 89, 90, because I, I, I would come out here, as I've just heard, in, in the summer of 87. Uh, other than working for IDC, I also worked for Adobe. I was on their type board, and I, I did some work for Apple. And every time I came back, then my friends were starting to buy Macs in Germany in, in the late 80s, and, and I would come back with a bag full of, of disks floppy disk, you don't remember, the little three and a half inch ones, and they were, they were like expensive, right? I don't know, like $400 per weight or whatever. It was, it was a lot of money, but still the Germans, my German friends would say, oh, can you bring me back whatever? Uh, I remember somebody wanted Palatino for, or, or, or for whatever reason, and uh, Clarendon, whatever the early typefaces were that from Adobe, so I, I would smuggle large amounts of uh, physical fonts back into the country, and then I thought, wait a minute, there's an idea here, you know, duh. Um, so let's do a mail order. So Font Shop was the first mail order um, font business. There was no data. You'd had to say, uh, tell, uh, send people a physical font, you know, in a, in a little sleeve. And we designed our own little cardboard sleeves and uh, started a business in, in 89. And the first catalog was, I think, had about 800 fonts in it. The last one that we printed what, five or six years ago had six and seventeen hundred pages. And I think it's, I can't remember, like 50,000 typefaces. And we gave up printing because it was just ridiculous. I still would love to, but on the other hand, I was the designer, but also the proofreader. So you want to read 700 pages that all say A to Z. Um, it gets a little tedious. You do it at night, and you fall asleep over it, and you'd be surprised how many mistakes you don't see, because you don't look at it anymore. I mean, it's A to Z, for Christ's sake. But is it in italic? Is it the right, wa right one? So I spend years of my, my, my life and the rest of my hair on, on doing that. <laughs> and another thing I, I think I learned from, from Type 87 that there are actually people who would pay, like you, you, know, you guys, did you pay to get here? Oops, see, there are people to pay first thing in the morning on, on a snowy Friday to hear people talk about type. I thought that was amazing. So we started um, the Typo Conference in Berlin, which has now become uh, a general design conference. We started in 95 the first time ever, so it's been 20, this year's the 23rd, in other words. Um, and I was the, the MC for a long time until I retired, and then they brought me back, whatever. I'm, I'm not the MC this year. So it's been going for, for all this time since 95. We get like 17, 1800 to 2000 people actually paying, and, and I think they pay quite a bit of money to get in there. And you can see on some of the pages, there's Chip Kid there, there's uh, um, some other, oh, Stefan Sagmas, of course, twice at least. There's Matthew Carter. Um, oh, there's Tobias and uh, Jonathan. On the, on the top there when they were still together. So ov obviously we have a lot of people come over from the States. We have people from all over the world. Um, this year is at the end, it's always at the end of May. It's always around my, b my birthday. So um, the trouble is, of course, uh, I'm officially retired, but as I, I suffer from typomania, I, um, how are we doing for time? Am I good? Yeah. I thought I was gonna be 12, 30 minutes. I, I keep rambling about this 45 issue. That I shouldn't do that. Okay, I have five minutes. I'm not bored at all. No, no, I just, uh, you know. Well, they have no choice. They hear they're paid, so I might as well sit through it. <laughs> now, for, for years, I've been, um, been thinking, this is my, was al always my favorite type. It's Accidentscotest Medium, as you've all known immediately. You did know, by the way, what the slides were that, that uh, Carol showed earlier, right? If you don't know what the type is, is on a slide you see, and you don't find out, you're stupid, and you will die stupid. So ask if you don't know. That was Franklin Gothic, of course. I did see Franklin Gothic, of course, which I, I think is still one of the best. And it's, it's what, 25 years old or so now, now is it? Late or more, mid-80s. Mid it's amazing. I mean, the original Franklin Gothic is awesome, but that, is, that was one of the best uh, revivals ever, I think. Anyway, that's Accidentscotest. Forever, I'd like this. This is a, this is a, a special way. If anybody's familiar with Accidentscotest, which most grown-up graphic designers are, this is the medium weight, but this is from a large uh, wood, wood type and it's a little thinner than the normal ones. I'm getting very specific here. If you look at the, the smaller weights, they are, they are heavier. So I went and redesigned it for myself only because somebody wrote a book about me, and I, the book I showed at the beginning, and I said, well, I'm not gonna get involved in designing the book. That would be disastrous. I mean, if the, the subject it becomes the, the interferer, but I will design a typeface, and I, 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 I will ask you to only use the one type and the one weight. So I designed this one weight only, and he designed a whole book with it. And then we had the little cue from Louisa there, and then I thought, oh, we might as well do this in, in wood. 
I did also did one for Hamilton a couple of years or three or four years ago um, as, as a favor again, and, and they can sell it, and I, I won't get any proceeds. This is a, a stupid hobby. I mean, each one of those costs about three, this, that's $1,500, $1,600 or euros worth of type on that table. This is 16 Cicero, which is 16 line, which is what, like that size. Um, that'd be about 210 points, whatever that is in millimeters. Um, and then you, you print that stuff. Now, why would anybody, uh, you know, build letterpress? There's one size only. You always run out of characters, even though I have a few more. Normally, you have only four or five characters. I, I, we printed one poster that became quite popular called Better Done Than Perfect. And in the word perfect, the first E is missing. The only reason it's missing because you only had four of them. And I didn't count the letters beforehand. Everybody thinks it's so bloody clever. But that's the good thing about the restraint, uh, that or the constraint, sorry, that you have in, 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 in wood type. You only have a one size. You can't make it a little smaller. You either have to rewrite the copy, which we do often enough anyway, go a large, much, much, much smaller, go to a different typeface, or give up the job altogether, or mix fonts in, in the same thing. So this is um, one reason why I, I had to recut it in, in this, this 12 sit or the, the, the medium weight, because uh, I didn't have enough O's in my original font to spell out assholes properly. And that's an important word to use, because that basically is, has been my motif, motto forever. And people keep saying, well, that's a bit, little bit arrogant. You know what? It's not arrogant. I've, I've worked for assholes, uh, and you kind of you walk in room, or they walk in room, and you kind of know this is not going to be, but I need the money, or the job's cool, or whatever. And they promise you, oh, you know, you'll be all over the press, and whatever. It was just a rubbish promise. I mean, they should pay for it. And whether you're over the press or not is another issue. But I've made the mistake often. I was too eager or blind or desperate or whatever, and it, those jobs never turn out well. They, they end up losing your money, reputation. Uh, you get into fights with your, with your people in the studio. You know, I had a couple of projects where, where I would come in back from the client and say, hey, you know, this has come back, and they would all sort of pretend to be busy or go to the toilet or whatever. Nobody wants to work for them anymore. And the same goes, of course, working with assholes. I mean, I've had people come into the studio with a portfolio that had some of my work in it, because these days everything is copy and paste. I said, wait a minute, you know. So people have said, made, sh shown me great portfolios, but they were kind of like, do I want this person around for, you know, like 10 hours a day for the next how, how many years? No, and that's more important. People can come there who have no training. I've, I've worked with people who are carpenters and butchers and, and chefs who became designers, and they, they were the most successful ones. So believe me, that's a good motto to live with. And um, finally, now, this is what I do now. So I have this stupid print shop. This is all the way from ITC. Uh, and I think I have the largest amount of bicycles. Um, I have as many proofing presses as bicycles. I have 18 bicycles. I think I have 18 proof presses now. Ah. It's something I want on my, on my tombstone. Here lies the guy with the most proof presses. <laughs> it's a stupid thing, but, but you know, it's, it's, like, it's like some of the other stuff. If I had hadn't bought them, they would have been thrown away. Uh, now they're becoming very fashionable. Now I, I just uh, I had one in, in San Francisco. I sold it for... I bought it for ten thousand uh, dollars, a proof press that was a piece of crap, which I had to, you know, spend half a year restoring. And then I gave it to the center for the book there. But if we don't have them, nobody will have them. And now I'm a letterpress printer again. And the reason why I do this is because of this effect. Not the one on the right, but the one on the left. And that was aptly described by Adrian Wilson. Um, we now print in books in Berlin in letterpress. We're not setting it for monotype or linotype because that's rubbish. You want to rekey, uh, you know, you want to capture the keystrokes again. But um, even from polymer, that little impression is, and everybody who looks at the books uh, says it's different. I have real publishers printing books letterpress because they want to impress on their readers that a book is something you make. You don't write a book. Nobody writes a book. You write a text, and then we make a book out of it. Uh, I could have shown you all the books I've been designing recently, uh, which I had done now in a bit of a competition to release. I like doing the insides, and I like doing the complicated books, the dictionaries and shit. And uh, this is the motto. See, I, I actually made another slide where I, uh, slide where I kerned the, the TY a little bit more, but you know what? I think kerning is way overrated. Um, I mean, if, if God wanted kerning, he wouldn't have made a T like this, right? Uh, he, if, if he wanted it perfect, they would have, uh, like Chinese, all the letters would be square. So there is a reason why we have those letters, and you can kern, but this is kerned a little, as you can probably see. I could have kerned it more, but life's too short for kerning, I think. And that was my little medal, and that's it. Thank you very much. Sorry, that was a little, for some reason, I hadn't looked, you know, this is the first time I ever delivered my slides like three days in advance. And of course, meant I have enough 
not looked at them for a, for a few days. So I went a little longer. I'm sorry, I, I rambled. We can do Q and A now, and uh, if there's any noise in the background, it's the elevator. I've just been told. So, does anybody want to? By the way, this you can look at all this shit there. Then it's all there on those urals, the urals. You know why I've been so slow? I'm really tired. Normally, I would have done that in ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking extended rather. Normally, I speak condensed, and and sort of bold condensed, but I had a lot of tracking today. Now, ab about curling, by the way, the, the similar thing is if you ever, whatever you do, open it up a couple of units, five or ten units in InDesign, it looks much better already. Curling is only, it's like, you know, fat guys wearing tight t-shirts. Don't do it. So you might as well just, you know, get a size up and then it won't look so bad anymore. Hi. Did you hear that? What, what sort of project we do in the letterpress workshop? Well, so far, um, I've spent three years just uh, um, getting press. I have a big warehouse full of presses. Now that people know about this stuff, we get a call every week from some museum or some printer is closing down. So I have this gigantic warehouse somewhere in halfway to Russia um, by the Polish border that we just have all this equipment because I can't dare throw it away. You usually don't pay for it. You usually just pick it up, which is not fun because everything is at least two tons. That'd be metric tons, whatever that is in, in your funny tons. It's heavy. I mean, a, pre a press like this weighs as much as a car, but cars have wheels. Those don't. <laughs> um, the idea was that we would do, we would, we would see how we can um, combine digital and analog, which is what we're doing. I, I bought a, a plate maker. I go direct to plate from from the Macintosh. I don't go through negatives. Here you do polymer, you do a neg, and then you do a, a polymer plate. We go direct to polymer. It's it's a, a FlexoPrint business. It was a lot of money, um, but you don't lose the quality. You have register. I can impose eight pages, and I make a plate, put that plate in the Heidelberg cylinder, and print straight away. So you get the advantage of the digital, meaning I get the best type op possible on, on the, on, on in, in InDesign. Uh, all the fonts I want, I can manipulate them. I can make them thinner or thicker, depending on how I want to print. But then I get the advantage of letterpress, which is really nice black ink, a little impression, not, not like the hipster stuff that you get in Brooklyn. Um, that was that is forbidden. I mean, you can't do that because it destroys the type. It doesn't anymore, but that's what I'm getting at. So that was the one thing we're doing. We're sort of reinventing book printing, which is actually commercial, commercially viable, not for 100,000 books, but we can print 1,000 or 500 or 2,000 at, at commercial prices, pretty much. Uh, the other thing is I, I want to do like experimental stuff. For example, I'm doing a monograph on Louis Oppenheim, the guy um, who designed low type and um, some of the Berliners, one of my heroes who died in 35 and nobody's ever written about him. And I have a lot of his original type in, in all sorts of sizes up to, up to that size. So I'm going to write a monograph, which will be digitally printed, a proper monograph, and then I'll print 50 or 100 books of the original type, just specimens. Uh, that's a totally uncommercial thing, but we might mix, again, we might mix digitally. If we have images, they'll be digitally printed. I'm not going to print four-color images in letterpress. That's stupid. It, it, the quality sucks, and it's too expensive. So that's what we're doing, and then basically it's just... Um, Make a new wood type again. It's stupid, but we're, we're 3D printing wood type. And we're cutting it on a CNC machine. Uh, the data is so good now that I can start doing it myself in the studio. I've got somebody in Romania doing it in Poland. We've even had uh, we've even had some some uh, metal type recast because I found somebody who can CNC engrave uh, brass matrices, and then we can cast from them again. Which again is stupid, because if I if I had a, a whole font done, 120 odd characters, it would cost me like. Two and a half thousand dollars just for the for the matrices, and then each size cost about three thousand dollars just for the for the for the type. So it's it's not commercially viable, but then what is? You know, and I mean I, I've got what I said like almost twenty bicycles, and altogether they cost less than a car. So I haven't been I haven't bought a car in thirty years, so that's where my money goes, I guess. And I think money is better spent on on type and on bicycles than on cars. In my, I don't need a car. We have public transport in Europe. No, you have in New York also, kind of. Hi, question. Um, what do you think of the signage here in America, or specifically in New York City? Because you've done the signage for. Well, the, the, the I mean the famous Vignelli uh, um, system, 
was a good system at, at the time. It's just like all these systems, you know, it's what now, 50 years old almost. It sort of starts falling apart a little bit, like all the, but essentially it's a good system. It's just a little complicated, but the system is complicated. If you have, you know, A, B, C, D, or whatever trains, and you have express trains and local trains, um, signage can only represent a system. It can't improve it. It can only make it accessible. And I think New York's about one of the better, better in the world. I know that the fight's been going on between maps and, and diagrams. I'm for diagrams, not for maps. The difference is another lecture. Um, it's one of my I wish it would they stick to the original Occidental test rather than going over to Helvetica, the WIMPs in the, in the late 70s, because AG is so much better for signage. Uh, if you ever go to Zurich Airport, the weight's too heavy, the white or the black also, it's a beautiful signage system. It has that European discipline. I guess that would be not appropriate, would be appropriate here, would it, because this is not Europe. <laughs> this is about the most European you can get in America, actually, <laughs> in New York, probably more European than some European cities. I mean, half of you are probably have probably got European roots, right? I have a question about the latest technology development in fonts, the variable fonts. Yeah. You uh, you said you worked at Apple, uh, you know, way back when when that stuff was first happening. Uh, and so I'm curious what what your outlook is on this new development. Well, for Apple, I actually I did the fonts for the Newton, so that's how far back that was in in uh, whenever that was in the early 90s, the bitmaps. Uh, variable fonts is fantastic. I mean, it's basically what we know. We 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 had uh, we already had. Uh, um, those fonts, you know, the, the multiple masters in, in the 90s from Adobe, they never went anywhere. And then we had GX uh, from Apple, they never went anywhere. Now we finally have what, what we, as I designers, have been using all the time anyway, because we always, I always make uh, um, inter and extrapolation anyway. If we design a large family these days, everybody wants 14 weights. I mean, the new Real, this is, you know, this is Real here, or Real, my, my, my latest typeface. We have three or four, or depending on how many poses we in interpolate. Um, and when we did the stuff for the TV, for example, we gave them 20 versions, all about five units apart. Uh, and you design in Font Lab or, or Glyphs, you design it a thousand units uh, or 24, 500, whatever. So a unit is, is, is pretty fine because those guys have to test it in the real world on the, on the TV screens. And this is basically what variable fonts does in a way. You can, you can have any old weight, you can have any old size, you can have any old thickness, uh, uh, any, any old uh, um, condensation or, or expansion. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, as always, a lot of people will be um, up to deep in, in it because it's not, not easy. You suddenly have all these choices. I mean, you have 14 weights and then you have three different widths and then you have uh, the weights in between. And as always, half of the people will use it wrong. But uh, the great thing I can see it for is for all the interface stuff that we have. Like Apple has now with San Francisco. Uh, the system knows if you go below, below, I think it's 16 or 17 pixels, it'll go for the the small weight. I mean, newspapers have been doing that for 100 years. You know, they know that a five-point typeface have to be cut differently from a seven-point typeface. Gutenberg knew it. Uh, we, we've all known this for a long time. So we, we basically we have arrived what uh, in, in the in the 1600s again, where type was size specific, because it has to be. You know, smaller sizes you need less contrast, wider characters, more more spacing. So we finally arrived where where we started uh, 500 years ago. Uh, which is great. We also finally realized that our, you know, our, our, our hands, our arms haven't changed, our eyes are still next to each other. So basically the book in its form is still the best way of reading and that's why an iPad or a, or a um, what's my, whatever my phone is, are basically like a book. So uh, if, if, if the uh, screen designers would have looked at book design a little more, they would have saved about 10 years of experimentation at our expense. <laughs> yes, it's a good thing in other words. It's just a shitload of more work for type designers, but then, as I said, I don't do that technical stuff, so I'm I'm easy. We have another question right oh, here. Oh, go ahead. Hello. Hi there. Oh. Uh, my name is uh, Luis Delumba. Back in '82, I was a letter designer for Linotype, uh, and I used to digitize uh, fonts that we would we would actually take uh, old Wiggins uh, drawings, yeah. and back in the '30s and '40s, there was not that many heavy or extra black weights, so we would draw them to match and then digitize with Icarus system. My question is, uh, is the, the Icarus uh, way of, of creating a typeface, is, are the points more accurate than the Bezier points, let's say in Font Lab or Fontographer? Well, it depends how you define accurate. I'm not sure whether oh. anybody's familiar. I mean, you're all, you've all used Illustrator in design, you've all you know what a Bezier curve is. It's a curve that has handles and you pull the handles and the cha shape of the curve. And, and it, it, there's two things to, I to uh, uh, remember. The position of the curve, you can do a, a circle from, theoretically from two 
two points. Normally you would have four points for a circle. And if you, know, if you pull the handles a certain way, it, it becomes circular. If you pull the handles, the shoulder, shoulders go out or the waist goes in or whatever. Now, um, Bezier curves are, are very easy to work with, but they have their own, um, how, can I, how can I say this? They have their own aesthetic. If you put them um, nicely, they all kind of look the same. Uh, because the Bezier, the, the, the mathematics have their own, own way of, of shaping a curve if you leave it up to the, whereas uh, Icarus, for example, you would need eight points to do a, a circle. You, you have to put a point every 30 degrees. Um, so, you know, instead of just, just X, X, X and Y, you have to put them in between, which also gives you the chance to manipulate a little more. Um, that's the one reason. So uh, if, you, if you use uh, Icarus points, which are different type of I won't go into mathematics, different types of splines from the Bezier splines, you can, it becomes less generic. That for me was the good thing, but for me the most important thing is that I can do a, a, a pencil drawing and it doesn't have to be perfect because when I, I put in the data, I can then make it perfect. In other words, you know, you can't draw to a hundredth of a millimeter, but you can digitize to a hundredth of or a thousand of a millimeter. Whereas Bezier is how the kids draw today, they draw on screen, they do overlapping shapes, which I still can't bring myself to do because the remove overlap works now, it never used to. Uh, meaning you can just clip bits together. And I see a lot of type or that is really cool, but they have this sort of generic kind of, okay, it's all a bit like too much nylon, not enough wool. I, I like things to be a little coarse, to be a little not always the same because that's what people like. We don't like everything made in a factory. And a lot of Bezier curves look like they come out of a robot, especially now with the variable fonts. They're all gonna look very, very mechanical. That's my only concern. Uh, that's maybe half the reason why I'm back to wood type or, or lead type because it is kind of irregular and unpredictable and uh, if you run out of character, you change the copy or whatever, you know, it's, it's, I like those constraints. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do prefer the Icarus system even though it's been dead for a long time. I mean, I still have my, my tablet. It works on an old Mac. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a, a Mac SE from 88 that, that I run the Icarus system on. Mm -hmm. well, you have to go for a coffee while you wait for the data <laughs> to, you know. Thank right. you. I, I, I used to work for a, a type shop where I would uh, digitize the lightest weight and the heaviest weight, interpolate the medium and the semi-bolt, and my boss would say, uh, when people come around, tell them that you drew all four weights, don't, you know, because they yeah, charge of course, it for yeah, all. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, the <laughs> same happens now. But yeah. clients have got wise to it. I mean, now they, yeah, yeah. I'm just doing a, a work for a large German airline, um, and um, they have yellow in the house color. I'm not supposed to talk about it. Uh, and of course, um, <laughs> We're giving them, them uh, the in-between ways, but they're wise to it. They know that, mm -hmm. well, we don't need four poles, maybe only three, let me save some money. Yeah. And then you can't charge a shit lot of money for the in-between weights anymore. I mean, it wasn't the a perfect- The cats out the bag. Yeah, it wasn't a perfect science. You still had to tweak it and check yeah, every letter. But anyway, thanks very much. Sure. <laughs> thank you. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>